This is simnews.tv and you're listening to the Super League Show. Hello everybody, we're almost at the halfway stage of the 2017 Super League Championship in GBVWC and the British Grand Prix really did give us some absolutely spectacular motor racing. We have got a lot to talk about. My name's Jake Sanson, beside me is Ben Willis and Casper Kolodicic, so let's get straight down to business. Ben and Casper, good evening. Good evening, nice to have you back, sir. Oh, Hello, do you again. know what? It's been such an agony having missed Monaco in Canada. <laughs> I am so guilty. I really should have been there. But I'm so glad I caught up. After the amazing drive from uh, Rudy Van Buren in Canada, we were all kind of expecting his back to be a little bit against the wall at Silverstone. But we had no idea by how much. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Of course, uh, the first thing we need to draw upon, uh, pre-race, we only had... Uh, 20 drivers show up for the British Grand Prix, largely because uh, there was no Storm Racing team there for that weekend. And also Woods Racing leaving Super League, Ben. That is big news. Yeah, it's it's not something I wanted to see, to be honest. Um, Woods is you know, it's a team full of history. They've been in Super League since 2004, which is just it's just crazy. 14 seasons, they've done something like 215 races, I think, um, and have, you know, solid nine wins uh, during their time and 44 podiums, they they're a team full of history, and it's it's such a shame to uh, to see them go. But you know, they were really struggling with drivers, and it's it's something we've seen this season. The driver market has been so tough, um, and it's just a shame it had to come to this. Really, uh, you know, they'll be sorely missed. And it's a difficult one as well, uh, Casper, when you look at the fact that we didn't have the uh, Storm Racing team there either. It kind of made the grid at times look a little bit thin. Yeah, it does kind of make you realize that uh, whenever that, that two drivers, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot when you think about it, but then when you're missing them, you really miss them. And you do very much realize how, um, how important it is to have the full grid, to have this entire track basically filled with cars so that we, ha we can have just a bit more action everywhere, right? Absolutely. And of course, with the Woods Racing team being gone in particular, Ben, what this does mean, of course, is that there are some certain ramifications uh, for the Trinity engine as well. And that's something that we do need to focus on a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. So obviously with Woods going as a manufacturer team, um, you know, there's, there's nobody controlling the Trinity engine development now. Um, so we expect that to get shifted over to their only customer, Greenstripes Racing. Now, Greenstripes themselves are struggling at times with drivers. Um, we could see the Trinity engine completely die at the end of the year and the tender being opened up for another team to start their own engine. So it'll be one to watch and it will certainly be you know, a, a long running and long felt theme throughout the end of this year and going into subsequent seasons as the whole, you know, we, we're, we're basically going to have a, a big engine market next year now that this is dropped. Mm, it does make some for, for some very interesting things in the off season. Let's talk about driver changes. Casper uh, Morris Bracan in at Adonis. That was an interesting one. He's obviously done Super Cup before, uh, never uh, really in the Super League. So this was a big ask for him to do uh, such an amazing job at Silverstone. Yeah, it's always going to be tough with these guys, especially when you're coming from uh, Super Cup. They're completely different, and even um, as we always mention, the tires are so different. You have to get used to it. The grip levels, the power, everything is different. And to be honest, it was always a tough ask for him to um, to do well in his first race. And if I recall correctly, he didn't do too badly in qualifying, but in the race, he may have had a little bit of trouble. Yeah, and it, it was never going to be easy. But, I mean, to be fair to him, he made the flag. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail as well. Over at Red Archer as well, Ben, an emergency driver brought in for Michael Ayres. That's interesting at this stage of the year. Yep, so Michael Ayres is in for Right Click, who has done, I think he's done the maximum number of emergency races he could have done, um, which suggests to me that Red Archer still haven't found a second primary um, for Daniel Benefield, who started at the team way, way back. Uh, back in Australia, mm. um, and, and left. So the fact they're still having to rely on emergency drivers is a bit concerning. Uh, Michael comes in with experience from another league, former sim racing, FSR, um, where he's he's shown some decent pace. So what will be interesting to see is his, you know, his development in a completely new environment for him, completely different cars as well. So definitely one to uh, keep an eye on. 
Mm. And it's interesting because a team like Red Archer should not really be scraping the barrel for mm. emergency drivers. So it kind of shows the uh, state of affairs at the moment. But uh, we won't uh, draw too much upon that. We need to look at upgrades. Uh, Nordian obviously uh, brought a really good upgrade package to Silverstone. They had uh, obviously a new front wing, uh, downforce settings were improved and a diffuser as well, Casper. So that meant that this car was definitely going to be a stronger package coming in. I'd say definitely. Uh, we have seen that upgrades aren't that big of a deal this season. Um, so far, and it's becoming more and more clear that it isn't. But even then, this uh, this uh, forward uh, downforce and the diffuser probably helps. May maybe even balance the car out a little bit more. Possibly help the drivers a little bit. Who knows? Um, open up a bit of uh, setup work with them. And yeah, they, it definitely caused the car to uh, be a bit quicker, possibly. And let's talk a little bit as well about what that meant for some of the other teams out there. Obviously, we're still waiting for a few more uh, developments. But yet again, Ben, you know, the Mad Cape story, <laughs> they are still the slowest car on the grid. And yet their drivers can do wonders with it. I mean, what is this all about? Exactly. I mean, again, as, as Casper's alluded to, the, the upgrade sort of potential window of, of, of de development and increase of speed is a lot smaller this year. So whilst Mad Cape have lagged behind, you know, all the way since the start when they basically just didn't develop the first few races, they're, you know, they're bringing updates relatively quickly now, but they they won't catch up. They're, they're still going to be in a lag behind. And they still will, on paper, have the worst car. Now, we've explained before how this doesn't necessarily translate to on-track performance. There's certain areas on these cars, especially the front wing, um, that are you know, they're your target areas you want to upgrade for. They'll give you the best performance per, per you know percentage of upgrades, and that's what Madcap seems to be doing. They're targeting their their small amount of upgrades um, in, in the right areas, and that's that's what's helping them. Um, you know, create a, a decent car. Absolutely. And before we talk about just how impressive uh, the Mad Cape story is going into Silverstone, we should talk a little bit about engines. Uh, some people able to run, uh, some people able to run with much stronger engine packages. Risto Capit, for example, at Vodbull was able to get a fresh engine, uh, but uh, Rudy Van Buren Casper was not able to. So obviously it's interesting how drivers are having to play the strategy at this point in the season with in terms of engines. Yeah, it's um, the, the season with engines is very interesting. I think a single race usually takes about a third of the engine. So basically, Rudy had a one race old engine compared to Risto having a new. So 100% to 62%. And that difference may, actually, may be already uh, kind of feelable for the drivers. I'd say it nearly definitely is. But uh, it definitely wasn't a risky play yet. It was a, just a standard play because this track definitely isn't necessarily one of the most power hungry track and, and you wouldn't really want a new engine until one of those comes up in a few race time mm. and before we really get into the nuts and bolts of the race itself we of course have to talk about tire choice because that was really one of the things that was going to be scrutinized very closely at silverstone every single team uh, bar two went for the ultra soft super soft soft uh, option of compounds to bring with them. Interestingly, uh, Cano went for super soft, soft, and medium, whereas GSR, the Green Stripes Racing Team, they went for ultra soft, super soft, and medium. So it was almost as if, to a certain degree, Ben, uh, Green Stripes were almost trying to go for a different strategy in order to get uh, the double points finish that they could have secured with the lower numbers this time. But un ultimately, unfortunately, it kind of came to nothing. Yeah, I think these are the kind of um, the kind of plays that the the teams towards the, the back of the grid need to make now. Um, you know, Green Stripes are at the bottom of the standings, um, and if they're going to have any chance of points, they've got to play it tactically with strategy. So trying to bring in a harder compound to try and get a bit further in the race, save a few pit stops, um, is you know ultimately it's a good idea to try. When it comes to the race, it may not have paid off, but you know it's it's, it's definitely worth a try. And the same from Kern out as well. Very surprised not to see him bring an ultra soft for qualifying, but. Uh, no, interesting strategies there. Absolutely. So what what do we talk about first? I suppose we talk about qualifying and that lap from Lee Morris. It really was absolutely incredible. But of course, uh, that qualifying performance was really kind of overshadowed in the end uh, by ultimately a really difficult pr situation uh, for Lee Morris. His controversial uh, penalty was upheld 
uh, from the contact at Monaco, and he was given a five-place grid job. Now, Casper, he didn't know about this uh, coming in. So the fact that he took it on the chin, lined up in sixth position and did the job he did in the race is actually quite an incredible reflection on his character. Yeah, uh, I, th I think, honestly, we now have seen that compared to... that It was something we talked about last time around when you weren't here, Jake, uh, came to fruition that we were considering if him even appealing this penalty last time at Monaco was a mistake in of itself in it of itself because right. of what can happen this race and now we see that it was indeed a massive mistake because he could have been started from the pole and well his race start as we also later discovered could have been a lot less chaotic mm. well is is this the kind of situation we have uh, sometimes ben do drivers when they feel that they can make a sort of a play to you know get a decision overturned is it almost as if lee morris is almost his own worst enemy in this situation because we've heard him speak out you know quite fervently before i mean even at the end of the british grand prix uh, he talked, you know, quite outspokenly about his lot and how he just feels so frustrated with the way that the regulations are this year. Do drivers just end up running the risk of being their own worst enemy in those situations? It's a tough one. So the whole appeal system was one of the new rules brought in this year. And I've had experience of it. I've used it for my own team that I run a Super Cup. Um, and when you're relatively sure that, you know, that you don't agree with a penalty... Um, then it makes sense to use use an appeal. Um, you have to be really confident with it, though, and I don't think Lee was in this case. I think it was more a tactical play of thinking, right, I don't want this grid penalty at, um, at Canada. I know I'm going to have a strong car. Um, I'll, you know, try and just try and push this away and hope that he won't get a penalty from it. Unfortunately, mm. in this case, it's cost him um, by not being confident in the fact that, you know, he didn't think it would... Uh, didn't think it would get upheld um, and, and that has hurt him he's, he's lost a, a pole position out of it and as we'll I'm sure we'll talk about later it's you know that, that's, that hampers your race as well absolutely well let's go straight into the uh, action itself from Silverstone it was all about Nordian right from the off in their race against Vodball and we kind of got an idea you know very very early on that uh, the strategy from Florian Geyer and David Fider was really aggressive against Vodball and it's incredible when you consider that they did two stops less than Vodbull purely by making the super soft tires last those couple of extra laps longer for each stint. So they actually played Vodbull uh, against their own strategies that they've employed this year, Casper, which is incredible. And you've got to say that, you know, the feisty drive that he gave at Silverstone, Florian Geyer, totally and utterly deserving of victory in those circumstances. He took all the pressure and just ran with it. Oh, it was beautiful, uh, the few, especially the last few laps, as we've seen as well. The pressure and the immense pressure show, uh, show, uh, being put on Florian and him absolutely not giving us an inch of space uh, when, where he didn't need to. Mm. And Van Buren just couldn't catch up in any way, shape or form. Um, and honestly, I think that while you could see that the pace in general of the Nordstrom scars was in the end slower at the end of stints because obviously these tires, they had to make them last and these tires do go, uh, go off in pace very, very rapidly. But in general as well, two pit stops, that's a lot. Even though this track, as we may even come to a bit later when we talk about uh, Baldy especially, yeah, this track does have quite a short pit stop delta as well. So mm. it's a very it was a massive fight and a very interesting one. And another thing, just quickly for Fidoc, wow, he started ninth and he was already up in the top three within the first yeah. few laps. Yeah, absolutely incredible. And it's very easy to forget that kind of thing. But yes, Fidoc, he showed why he is the reigning world champion. He did an awful lot with very, very little, which is fantastic. Double podium for Nordzian with uh, Rudy Van Buren fighting his way to second position. Himself only starting on the second row. That was a surprise, actually, to see Rudy Van Buren not, you know, so strong on the front of the grid. Uh, so that was an interesting time of it. But clearly, uh, on lap four, lap five, Ben, we we learned very quickly that the talking point of the race was just how woeful the ultrasofts were at Silverstone. I mean, nobody was expecting. We knew it was they weren't going to last long. Maybe six, seven, possibly eight laps at a push, but five laps. That's just embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely appalling. It was absolutely awful. Um, and I think what this race did was highlight 
the clear problems with the tyres because if the the delta between the ultra soft and the hard compounds were a lot smaller, we would have seen people take you know harder tyre compounds to avoid pinning as much. But the problem is at the moment is the ultra soft is so fast over those four laps that it it makes sense to stop you know six, seven, eight times because you end up being faster somehow because that ultra soft mm. is just so there's so much more grip over those four laps. Okay, when they go, they're you know they're toast. They're just like driving on jam or something, but um. When when they are in their operating window for those four laps, you know, four or five laps, they are the fastest tire by far. Um, and I, I yeah, Sil Silverstone has um, it's it's served to show the 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 big issues with the tires this year. So what um, happens then, Casper? Uh, do, do, for the good of the sport, do we look at this and say clearly the ultra softs are not good for the show? Yes, they're faster, but only for four laps. Do we just outlaw the ultra soft tire from now on, and we just kind of see what happens with teams going down the super soft, soft, and medium option, or even soft, medium, hard? I mean, is that the answer? I mean, I'm not entirely sure if that's the answer, considering the super softs only la uh, well, unless you really nurse them home, only last for a few laps as well. And I think a lot of the a lot of what we see as well. Um, on top of the tires having such sort of a short lifespan is the way that people drive them because these tires do give a lot of speed for the first few laps. And, I'm, and we will come onto it uh, later on, but even on super soft, if you push them hard, they only last another two or three laps. Mm. To, to jump in there, sorry. Um, it, I think instead of outlawing the ultra softs, the better option here is we, we're coming up to a summer break after Hungary. Mm. You know, that's four weeks where the mod team can go away look at the tyres, do loads of testing, and, you know, a bit bit like what Pirelli were suggesting with their real-life F1 this year, yeah. was to have a second spec of compound, you know, re ready in, in case they needed to be changed. Um, and I think that's something we could look at here over the summer break, introducing a second specification of all the tyres to make it a bit more balanced. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the other idea I kind of had in the back of my head briefly was that maybe the Ultrasoft could be used as a qualifying tyre only. And then maybe you'd actually get, you know, you'd get a stunning qualifying lap or two maybe out of the tyre. And then you could you, you could use that tyre for quality and then everything else you, you just have to use for the race. But then I've also thought about it from the point of view of, well, we've seen a couple of drivers this year, Casper, who have been able to use these tyres and get more out of them. I mean, Silverstone was a great case in point. You look at the Norsian drivers, they were able to make the super soft tyres last a couple of laps longer, even than Rudy Van Buren, who has been the master of tire choice this year and entire life so you know is this just a case of drivers are going to need to learn just how to adapt to the situation when we've seen drivers like lee morris who have said it's impossible i can't work with them i can't work with these tires but we've seen other drivers who have just kind of got on with it and said okay well we need to figure out how we make those tires work is it more just kind of you know sort of adapting to the situation possible or does it genuinely have to be scrutinized uh, from my point of view, it genuinely has to be scrutinized because the, it, this is not acceptable. Because even the lowest amount of pit stops is literally just four la uh, four pit stops from Thomas Hintz. No mm. one else except for Nordstrom uh, and one Mojave has done less than six. Yeah. So at this rate, I don't think that the uh, that just changing your driving st uh, style is the answer here. And uh, we uh, Lee Morris has done eight pit stops here, so that's the extreme yeah. end of this. But even then, you shouldn't, even being ultra aggressive, be doing eight pit stops. I think they yeah. need to be scrutinized. Okay, well, that's something obviously that we'll need to address for the uh, midsummer break. Meanwhile, uh, it's worth pointing out that through all of this, Rudy Van Buren has actually been beaten for the first time this season in a pure race. Because yes, he was beaten in China by Gego Baldi, but it was raining, so obviously that kind of that kind of gave us a little bit of a curveball in terms of strategy. And Baldi and the Valtteri Automotive team were able to utilize the wet a lot better than uh, Vodbol. But it was an an unusual variable because nobody had really been given the wet weather tires before, so we'd no, never had that opportunity before. So in a straight race, uh, dry track, everybody being even. It was Nordsian who finally managed to break Rudy Van Buren and his dominant run of four wins in a row came to an end. Now, Ben, does this mean that there is a glimmer of hope for the rest of the season? Now that people have seen Nordsian go head to head with Rudy Van Buren and the Vodbol team and they've beaten him fair and square, 
and Rudy, you know, he even put his hand up and said, you know, they just caught us out. They just beat it. You know, they were just better today. Is that a glimmer of hope for the rest of the season? Can they be beaten over the rest of the championship? Um, I'll say a maybe to that one, I think. Uh, the problem with Silverstone was it was a combination of factors. VB sort of got their strategy wrong at points. You know, they've done two extra pit stops. Their first stop on that five, both VBs came at the same time. and They were having to double stack, which is... Yeah, that was a yeah. big mistake, to be fair. Exactly. That's, a, they... that's a rookie error from such an experienced team. It's, I, and yeah. uh, and Just... yet again, yet again... Risto Capit was basically the one left out to dry in that situation. And you've, yeah. you've got to, you've got to look at it from the point of view of, okay, yes, Rudy Van Buren is leading the championship, but Risto Capit is still capable of winning races. And here is a guy who's working his socks off, doing as much hard work as Rudy Van Buren. And again, mm. you know, being left out to dry here. I mean, what happens as a result of this yeah. now? Just a quick you know, way to interject. Um, actually, Mike Pittman has p uh, put this into here about 20 minutes ago. Um, right. He actually was not on the pit wall for this race. This is the first race he actually missed on the pit wall. That'll be and why then. Yeah. That, that is exa exactly why the strategy person was not there to call the move. You know what yeah. that shows? That shows how crucial having someone there you know, to follow the strategy, to follow the tail of the race from different teams. Absolutely. It's just crucial in this thought where we've got so many stops and that is sort of a knock-on effect of, of the ties, you know, causing these crazy strategies we have. And you um, know that Mike I, Pittman is now never going to miss another race as long as he... Uh, absolutely, yeah. not, as long as he... As long as he <laughs> so <laughs> to make sure that doesn't happen again. But Ex absolutely. Exactly. It, well, if it's... It had, end of the day, their strategy cost them the win here. We know Van Buren is crazy fast. Um, but end of the day, they cost themselves a strategy and Nordson were able to protect the tyres better. And at such a high deg tyre track, this, that, that's what's helped them. So mm. looking forward, I think we could see Nordson spring some more surprises where the tyres become extremely reliant. Otherwise, it will be down to pure pace, like at Hungary next time, where it's a bit mm. more lower degradation. Be a and I, I, I want to look at actually the the way that the Vodball strategy then impacted on Rudy Van Buren's driving because he actually showed necessarily uh, a you know an on the demonstrative streak, but in terms of the way he handled himself in with racecraft, he showed a lot more aggression than we've seen so far this year because you could you could sense that the team were kind of running scared a little bit, their back was to the wall, they had to do something and. More than once during the race, uh, RVB basically decided, you know, to take the rule book and flirt with it a little bit at times. I mean, particularly uh, his move on David Fyduk, not only at the start, but at Stowe Corner as well, Casper. It was clear that Rudy was, you know, determined to do every single thing he could to beat these guys. And it was very interesting to see a side to him we haven't seen this year. Yeah, we didn't get to see the side of him before because he wasn't put in the situation this Time, he actually had to battle his way through the uh, through the rest of the grid, and uh, yeah, we and we have seen that he was not the fa uh, fastest here in uh, outright. He was uh, he had to battle with, people, with uh, even people to himself, uh, even drivers to himself. I'm sorry. And then when he did have DRS, and then he did dive on the inside of Stowe, he just he just didn't quite un uh, seem to get where his grip limit is, and the car just went sideways into uh, Fidex slightly and that got him the move and that let him get the move. So there's a bit of a, yeah, it nearly seems like he kind of didn't feel where his grip is, which is very odd for a Rudy. Yeah, it's not the Rudy Van Buren we know, and it definitely makes things interesting heading into the Hungara ring. Also as well, I know we had two teams that were missing, Woods or Storm, but we only had 20 starters. We had 13 finishers. That is very low for a GPVWC Super League race. I mean, it was almost the case of if you just kept on going, you'd end up in the top 10 just by virtue of the fact that no one else was there to play. So it was very interesting. Obviously, you know, there are a few factors that contributed to that. Gergo Baldi, of course, uh, from the top five. I mean, he was running very strong in P4. He, he was at one stage going for the victory, but I think he just spent too long on the Ultrasofts before making the switch. And that's what really counted him out. But then, you know, a disconnect, completely not his fault. And it's a real shame he didn't get points. Uh, but Olsen, bless him, Tobias Olsen, right at the end of the race, uh, pulling the absolute Kimi Raikkonen of Kimi Raikkonen's on the Wellington straight. 
on the final lap and then running what can only be described as you know a broken machine uh <laughs> sliding sideways doing more rally cross impersonations than he yep. was gpvwc super league uh, on the final lap i mean how he brought that car to the line and then dragged it across the line ricky bobby star was pretty incredible actually yeah i mean um it was a pretty crazy race the, the weird thing was though that a lot of these dnfs weren't necessarily you know dirty driving or anything it was just a couple of mistakes no. Obviously, Baldi's one was, you know, it was horrible. It was just a, a disconnection, which we saw for Rudy Van Buren in, in Russia. That cost him the race win. Here it's cost Baldi a good result. Um, okay, his strategy was a little all over the place. Um, you know, eight stops by the time he disconnected, he would have probably had to have made a ninth, which would have, um, yeah, that would have been the most out of anybody. But, uh, yeah, it, was, it, well, it wasn't uh, necessarily an unclean race or, you know, there was a little bit of contact. It was just... A bit of a weird one that's been amplified by the fact that we've had quite a low turnout so i think that's yeah. why it stands out a bit more really i tell you the one thing that really disappointed me from the race is that we didn't see what Jarl Tain could do on his return that would have been an absolutely incredible factor in the race because in qualifying he put the Wouters what only a couple of tenths of a second slower than Gergo Baldi mm -hmm. on his comeback so that would have been absolutely amazing to see what he could have done to the race battle. I mean, he could even, Casper, have messed about with the order of the podium come the end of the race. I mean, I hope he sticks around for the Hungaroring because that could really throw a spanner into the works for a few people. Yeah, for somebody who comes back right, uh, like this and is already so quickly, I mean, that just shows the talent from, of Jarl. And, well, let's definitely hope for him to stick with that Valders for, uh, for Hungaroring because that could be very, very good. And Hungaroring is a very much a driver's track in many respect so we'll see and uh hopefully he can do well and uh uh yeah again hopefully he's going to be there and there's a few other drives that we do need to mention very briefly uh obviously we're talking about bar de Vosch, who again silently got on with the job running on softs pretty much for the entirety of and putting the car in p5 i mean what a mature cool rhythmic metronomic drive from him ben i mean he didn't look like he was in danger of losing a decent position at any point through the race. He just quietly got on with it and minding his own business and came up with P5. Exactly. And this is something I said to Casper before we came on air, actually. But Voss is one of those drivers who isn't necessarily the fastest over a single lap, isn't necessarily the fastest over a full race, but he is consistent and he will always, you know, get that car to the end, you know, within his means. And he's there to profit whenever people have misfortunes. And we've seen this time and time and again where DeVos, you know, he qualified um, P10 and he's finished P5 with a really solid, you know, result there. Um, so it's it's not necessarily surprising. It's something we know DeVos is capable of, but it's, you know, nevertheless a brilliant drive just by being there at the end and uh, profiteering from other people's misfortunes. So if we look briefly through the top five, we've got Florian Geyer, Rudy Van Buren and David Fidek making a fantastic podium. Uh, Risto Capit, solid in fourth position. Again, I think he'll feel really kind of cheated from an opportunity to win uh, the race. He had a good position in the early stages. Uh, Bar de Vosch, uh, very solid in fifth position. The comeback kids on home soil, Lee Morris and Alex Cooper, getting involved in that incident on the first couple of corners with Jarl Tain. That pretty much decided their fate. For the rest of the race and after them it was just playing catch up they did a good job to get themselves into the points uh, thomas hins again for red archer a very solid job with tired egg that was always going to be an interesting one to challenge but he made it into the top eight with some good solid driving fran lopez well he had a fran lopez race in a fran lopez car in gpvwc super league didn't he he looked good at times looked reasonable at others it, it was kind of what we came to expect from him, really, in the top 10, as always. I mean, David Francic, you have to feel so sorry for the SRS driver. He had so many opportunities to be in the top six right from the start, uh, but it just kind of spiralled out of control and got bad to worse. But to fight back to the top 10, uh, not bad going. Zubinek, Olsen and Ayers, the only other finishers. Uh, well, I suppose we should really look at the best and worst uh, from this particular race. Casper, who's your best driver of the race? I think I know this one already, though. I, I think this one is quite clear. I mean, Foran Geyer has shown such a great race. Absolutely on it. Not a show of uh, hesitation. Absolutely there. Uh, no, no sign of the pressure being put on him, which was massive. And we have criticized him earlier, or I have a sp a specifically criticized him earlier this season 
for not showing what he's uh, capable of. And I think he's finally showing what he is definitely capable of. This is fantastic stuff from Florian. Ben, your thoughts on this one? Hard to argue with Casper there. I mean, Florian drove a brilliant race. Um, and David as well, his teammate. Again, really solid result for Norton. It's just what they needed in terms of the title fight. Um, and as we've mentioned, this could open up you know, future brilliant races for the rest of the season. Yeah, I think as they say on uh, the X Factor, it's three yeses. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely absolutely spot on from Flo Geyer. He did an absolutely brilliant job. And I suppose we kind of use the same argument, Casper, uh, to talk about the best team of the race with Nordsjön. You couldn't really give it to anyone else. No, I mean, Norston, especially with Fidoc, also making it up from P9 starter to P3. Yeah. He basically was there within the first, uh, was it 10, 15 laps? He was absolutely. already fighting there. I mean, that's some amazing stuff from Norton. They have finally, I think, started to understand the tires better. They have started playing some mind games, so some tricks on tires, which no one expects. And I think they're doing absolutely a fantastic job so far. I just want this now to be the, the form for the next 10 races. You yeah. know, Norton versus Vodbol at each other's throats at every single race with Gergo Baldi popping his nose in for a look every now and then. That is exactly what I want for the rest of this year. Uh, so we go obviously to the worst drivers and the worst teams of the weekend. This is a harder one. What would you say, Ben, on this one? Who was your worst driver? I'm going to call out Nick Rowland because there's now three races in three that he's DNF'd. It is also three races in three that he's had a first lap contact mm. and three races in three that he's retired of some form of damage. Um, and when you see his teammate Lee Morris, you know, putting in, okay, you know, we maybe expect a little better from Morris and obviously the whole penalty shenanigans, but a good result, nevertheless, in what is not the best car on paper, your teammate should be doing a lot better to support that team, you know, drive up the table. So for me, Roland, yeah, needs to really, really improve. Okay. Casper, uh, your thoughts on this one? I mean, it's hard to argue again. Um, well, I, I guess the dip another disappointment is with maybe not per se a person, but Baldi's internet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The Hungarian, yeah, the Hungarian internet was absolutely awful. I, I guess I, I wonder if Rudy Van Buren sent him a nice package in the post, and it's not actually that nice a package anymore. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if he sent him a present. Uh, yeah, so it, that was difficult for Gego Baldi. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's difficult to really think of anything. I don't really want to throw the uh, worst driver of the weekend to Yaltain because we didn't really get to see. Uh, what he was capable of. And I'm not entirely sure you could really put the fault to any one driver in that incident as well, because it's, you know, three very feisty yeah. drivers in Yaltain, Lee Morris and Alex Cooper, all wanting the same bit of tarmac. They're racing drivers. They will go for it. Uh, so th it was never going to come out clean. Uh, but I suppose I'd like to throw a bit of a candidacy in there for Lee Morris, because that's a race he could have won. That is a race he could have won right there. And he, that stuff that happened off the circuit interfere a little bit with his race and even his form in the race this time i feel he probably could have done a little bit better had he not been quite so hot-headed it was quite clear after the race you know he's letting these issues get to him he's letting these issues get under his skin and you need to have a little bit more i suppose you need to be a bit more like a duck you need to let these things roll off you know like the water off the back you need to take these things with a pinch of salt and it just seems one too many times this year maybe casper that lee is letting this stuff get to him and he shouldn't be yeah i think i think that's actually fair to say to be honest about lee and we can definitely see that in his uh in his performances just uh, his one lap pace is there he, he can do well in the races but he is just not quiet uh yeah, I, I think he just does let uh, it all get to him. I think that's just it. And he needs to either toughen up a little bit and just try to get his head down and work his uh, work as hard as he can mm. on trying to win, uh, win more races this season. Yeah, uh, or at least I, I, good for Yeah, because I don't want to make this sound like we're attacking Lee Morris here, Ben, because at the end of the day, whatever he comes into the race with he does get an awful lot out of the car. I mean, let's not forget the fact he is in the top three in the point standings and he does deserve to be there. But there have been a few times this year where Lee has done the job in qualifying. He's been absolutely flawless in the first part of the weekend. And when it comes to the race, and he even made the joke himself after the race, it's almost Yano Trulli-ish. I don't yeah. want to say that about 
bit. I don't want to say this about Lee Morris, Ben, because he is a better driver than his uh, current form seems to be showing credit for. Oh, exactly. I mean, let's not forget Lee Morris is a driver who's fought for a title before in Super League. Um, but then he's always been highlighted for his, you know, his hot headedness. It's almost, you know, one of his biggest traits, really. Um, you know, be it good or bad, sometimes it's helped him drive really good races. Mm. Um, other times it's obviously come here to fruition and, and not help so much. Mm. Um, and I, I think if he can work on that race pace, work on the consistency, then, you know, there's no reason he can't be winning races. Um, and, the next, yeah. and the next one, of course, the Hungara ring, is yeah. a perfect opportunity for somebody like Lee, the way he drives, to really utilise that and untap exactly. it. Exactly. It's a completely different track. Uh, you know, we're no longer relying on power. It's it's down to downforce and setup, um, and for getting the most out of the car you can. It's not going to be as easy to pass. Um, it's a lot more sort of tight, twisty kind of kind of circuit. So, if he can extract the pure maximum from the from the car, then it's his race to win. Yeah, pole position and a good start at the Hungara ring exactly. could be exactly what Lee Morris needs to get his season off to a good start at exactly the halfway point of the season. So we're all rooting for him uh, to go for that. There's plenty of drivers that could win at the Hungara ring, of course, but it's the last race before the summer break, Casper. And that means, of course, that that's ob obviously an opportunity for drivers to use up uh, an old engine. I would guess probably... Uh, one guy who's definitely going to use an old engine for this one is probably going to be Risto Capit. I think a golden opportunity was taken away from him at Silverstone with a silly rookie error in the pits. He's not going to want to ha have a high-risk situation at the Hungara ring. No, I think that's... And especially that you're not going to uh, gain anything really out of a uh, new engine at Hungara, at Hungara ring, considering it's definitely not a power track. Uh, I, I think it's a very good idea to actually take up an older engine. I think it's a good idea for pretty much everybody who has uh, mm. an older engine that maybe 40, 50, 60 percent lying around there. Mm. And as long as it can last the race, I think they'll be uh, definitely looking at choosing one up. OK, one last thing before we go. Pick a winner because the Hungara ring oh, has so many, so many variables as a circuit. We know that things are going the way they are in terms of tire strategy. And we know this time that Rudy Van Buren and the Vodbull team can be beaten. So, who do you pick as a winner at the Hungara Ring? Come on, Ben, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who would you pick as a Hungara Ring winner? David Fidek for his first win of the season. Uh, no, okay. oh. no, you didn't just go for David. <laughs> yeah, oh. I just did. I just did. And <laughs> I was just I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You were you going why. to say the same thing. You were going to say the same thing. <laughs> yes. um, I'll tell you why, because he's going to be slightly annoyed now that Guy has got Norton's first win of the season, given this is Fidek, the reigning champion. He's mm. going to want that that win. He's going to want to beat for ball, which the team has struggled to do. Now they know they can. They've found their, their weakness, in a sense. Um, you know, they're going to try and exploit that. And uh, Yeah, I, I think Fidek could do it. I've got two ideas in my head. Uh, so I'm going to say both of them in the hope that one of them happens. <laughs> I mean, that's slightly <laughs> cheating, but okay. <laughs> yeah, but... fine. I, I've been away for two races. I'm going to be controversial. <laughs> uh, one of them is Lee Morris, because as we've already mentioned, if he gets pole position and gets a good start at the Hungara ring, he doesn't even need to dominate and pull away. He can control his own pace of the race. You can use tyre life better at the Hungara ring than you can in other places. As you say, it's not a power circuit. So it's a better opportunity for him to really exploit uh, the Mad Cape car. It doesn't matter that it's the most efficient car on the grid at uh, the Hungara ring. He can really use that to his strength and just play to what he's good at. So that could be a, a, a race to turn it around. So Lee Morris is one of them. The other one, if he starts the race, is Jarl Tain because we know how good a driver he can be. It was. I think he's going to be frustrated that at Silverstone he wasn't really there. And I think it's about the point in the season where we need a curveball. We need a, res a result where something unpredictable is going to happen. Because it happens once or twice a year in GPVWC. The Hungara ring, it's that midway point. Everybody's frustrated about trying to get the best they can. They'll all be cautious on engines. I think I think stuff's going to kick off, not necessarily in terms of uh, collisions on the circuit or drivers getting into the wars. I just think it's going to be one of those mad races where everything and anything happens. And somebody like Jarl Tain, who's got nothing to lose, no pressure, he might just be able to pick up the pieces. He might just be able to give out as their second win of the year. Yeah, it's, I, a, it's, it's valid. It's a, it's a mad one. It's out there. Yeah. 
but I'm going to go for it. So, Jarl, if you're listening, come to Hungary, please. <laughs> you could get a win here. I've already just decided it. So go on, make it happen. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, it's, a, it's been great once again to be back on the Super League show. I've really enjoyed coming back. And again, it enforces my decision to be doing this in 2017 and hopefully beyond as well. Uh, let's uh, tell you about some more shows you can catch up with. On the 29th of June at 10 p.m., it's The Scrutineer. Make sure you tune in for that. On the 3rd of July, Parker's Pit Stop is uh, once again on the air. And of course, we are back uh, the week after the ninth race of the season, the Hungarian Grand Prix. Uh, don't forget, of course, to keep up to date with us via at SL Show SN on Twitter using the hashtag SL Show. And of course, a nice cheeky little plug for at Downforce UK. Our involvement with GPVWC is a reasonable one for this year. We're hoping next year it's going to be bigger, better and bolder. Long may it continue. A huge thank you to uh, Kasper Kolodicic and Ben Willis. Thank you for sharing the office with me once again. No worries. Thank you. Lovely as always. And now that we know that the mighty force of Vodbull can be beaten, it's up to the other nine, 10, possibly 11 teams on the starting grid to make sure that this isn't just a one-off. It isn't just a fluke. It's a regular occurrence. Has the championship fight just begun or is this just a hiccup? in the Rudy Van Buren freight train. We'll find out when we get to the Hungarian Grand Prix in two weeks' time. I'm Jake Sanson on behalf of me, Ben Casper, and everybody at uh, simnews.tv and the Super League show. We'll see you again in two weeks' time. Bye for now. <laughs>